What's up, YouTube? Brian here. Welcome back to 1517 Films, where in every episode I'm always contending for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. And on this uh, Wednesday of the fourth uh, week of Lent, we are continuing on through the Gospel of Mark. We're into Holy Week. We're in chapter 12. We've got another great quote from the Lutheran Church Fathers. And of course, our ongoing catechesis still talking about that amazing gift of God baptism. Stick around. <music> Alright, so on today's episode, we're closing out uh, Mark chapter 12. We're into Holy Week now, and we're going to go, as we come up to Holy Week, actually, we're going to finish out the Gospel of Mark, uh, but we're slowing down a lots of chapters in Holy Week, and Jesus definitely has some incredible teaching for us here, so let's get right into it. Let's pick up with Mark chapter 12, beginning at verse 28. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, he asked him, Which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, The most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and there is no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. And as Jesus taught in the temple, he said, How can the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? David himself, in the Holy Spirit, declared, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord, so how is he his son? And the great throng heard him gladly. And in his teaching, he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like greetings in marketplaces and have the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. And he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums. And a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. And he called his disciples to him and said to them, Truly, I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. Lots here. Um, I, I want to touch on a couple of things. Uh, the, the greatest commandment, uh, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So there is one God. Uh, but Jesus is going to reveal a little bit of the mystery to us without actually addressing it. So uh, in, in many conversations with, let's say, I don't know, oneness Pentecostals, where they cling to this, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. There's one God. So there's no Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Well, hold on a minute. Jesus tells this guy, you are not far. <laughs> You're there. There's one God. But we see here, David himself in the Holy Spirit, by the Holy Spirit, saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit in my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David calls him, Lord. So this is kind of a question, who is the Christ? Who is the Messiah? Who is the one to come? Well, it is the Son of God. Now, a, a well-respected ancestor like David wouldn't call someone, one of his descendants, Lord. Well-respected ancestors didn't do that with their descendants, but David calls his descendant 
Lord. And this divine conversation here, we see divine conversation all over the scriptures. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. Where does Jesus go and sit when he ascends after his resurrection? To the right hand of the Father. And so we have the Lord, the Father, speaking to the Lord, the Son, and Jesus himself says, David spoke in the Holy Spirit. So this is the divine mystery, that there is one God, but there are three persons. The Father is God, the Son, God, and the Holy Spirit, God. But there are not three gods, just one God. And we get, let's talk about this command, these commandments for a little bit. Um, when I was overseas, I had a chaplain who would say, oh, the, the Christians, aren't, Christians aren't bound to the Ten Commandments. Hold on here. I beg to differ, and I think so does Jesus. Jesus says, So love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If we look at the Ten Commandments, we can divide them into what's been called two tables. And we know there were two tablets, but two tables... The first three commandments are how do we love God with heart, mind, strength, and soul? Well, we keep the first three commandments, don't we? How do we love our neighbor? We keep commandments four through ten, don't we? And, and in keeping those, we still are serving the greatest commandment to love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, and soul by loving our neighbor as ourselves. So this, if you were ever wondering is why Christians still keep the Ten Commandments. Now, we have an incredible writing uh, from, I believe, the Apology of the Augsburg Confession. Yep. So uh, another great quote uh, to go along with our theme of faith of our Father. So this comes to us from the Apology of the Augsburg Confession. Throughout the prophets and the Psalms, this worship, this latria, is highly praised, even though the law does not teach the free forgiveness of sins. The Old Testament fathers knew the promise about Christ, that God, for Christ's sake, wanted to forgive sins. They understood that Christ would be the price for our sins. They knew that our works are not a price for so great a matter. So they received free mercy and forgiveness of sins by faith, just as the saints in the New Testament. To this point belongs those frequent repetitions about mercy and faith that appear in the Psalms and the prophets. For example, Psalm 133 says, If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? Here David confesses his sin and does not list his merits. He adds, But with you there is forgiveness. Verse 4. Here he comforts himself by his trust in God's mercy, and he refers to the promise. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in his word, I hope, verse 5, this means because you have promised the forgiveness of sins, I am sustained by your promise. Therefore, the fathers also were justified, not by the law, but by the promise and faith. It is amazing that the adversaries diminish faith to such a degree, even though they see that it is everywhere praised as a great service. For example, Psalm 50, verse 15 says, Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you. God wants himself to be known. He wants himself to be worshipped so that we receive benefits from him and receive, from, and receive them because of his mercy, not because of our merits. This is the richest consolation in all afflictions. The adversaries ban such consolation when they diminish and disparage faith and teach only that by means of works and merits, people interact with God. In Luther's day, uh, the Roman Catholic Church was very much about works. Um, they still kind of are, although they're sneaky about it. <laughs> um, you don't buy indulgences anymore. You follow the Pope on Twitter, but same same premise. So, speaking of gifts and, and free uh, righteousness credited to us. Let's continue with our Lenten catechesis out of Luther's large catechism, uh, select portions still about baptism. So we've talked about what is baptism, what are the benefits of baptism. Now we're on to how uh, can water do such great things. In the water is God's word or command and God's name. 
His name is a treasure greater and nobler than heaven and earth. Baptism is quite a different thing from all other water. This is not because of its natural quality, but because something more noble is added here. God himself stakes his honor, his power, and his might on it. Therefore, baptism is not only natural water, but a divine, heavenly, holy, and blessed water, and whatever other term we can find to praise it. This is all because of the word, which is a heavenly, holy word, which no one can praise enough. For it has and is able to do all that God is and can do. Isaiah 55, 10-11 In this way it also gets its essence as a sacrament, as St. Augustine also taught. Quote, when the word is joined to the element or natural substance, it becomes a sacrament. End quote. That is a holy and divine matter and sign. You must honor baptism and consider it glorious because of the word, for God himself has honored it both by words and deeds. Furthermore, it is both by words and deeds. Furthermore, he has confirmed it with miracles from heaven. Do you think that it was a joke that when Christ was baptized, the heavens were opened and the Holy Spirit descended visibly and everything was divine glory and majesty? Luke three twenty one through 22 I encourage again that though these two, the water and the word, by no means be separated from each other and parted. For if the word is separated from it, the water is the same as the water that the servant cooks with. It may indeed be called a bathkeeper's baptism, but when the word is added, as God has ordained, it is a sacrament. It is called Christ's baptism. Words to reflect on, we pray. Lord Jesus Christ, our great high priest, cleanse us by the power of your redeeming blood that in purity and peace we may worship and adore your holy name. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Until next time, may God richly bless you in the grace and mercy won for you by Jesus' vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins.